I am the last one. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Welcome to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 3, page 97. Huh. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. We are your hosts. Thanks for joining us. The story today, see how I switched it up, Ooh, is... <laughs> Freelanga by Jason Sanford. Jason Sanford is the author of a number of short stories, essays, and articles, and is an active member of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. He co-founded the literary journal Story South, through which he runs the annual Million Writers Award for the Best Online Fiction. And one of his stories is forthcoming in the year's Best SF14, edited by David Hartwell and Catherine Kramer. While others have been published in places like Analog Science Fiction and Fact, Interzone, Orson Scott Card's Intergalactic Medicine Show, and the Mississippi Review. Freelanga was originally published in the online anthology I Am This Meat from Susurus Press. For more information on Jason Sanford, please go to www.jasonsanford.com. We'd also like to thank Liz Mirzievsky and Abigail Hilton for lending their voices to this episode. Free Langa by Jason Sanford. There's nothing a person can't do. Hike Olympus Mons without oxygen. Change the universe into something it'll never be. Outrun the things which won't be outrun. I wake in the middle of the night, remembering myself even as I realize the Mavich is coming for me. Beside me, my wife, Lauren, moans slightly and rolls over, taking the bed covers with her. I wish I could wake her. Wish I could tell her about hiking Olympus Mons without breathing gear. My body so pumped full of oxygen regeneration cells that I shook for the last week of the climb. Until now, I'd forgotten the accomplishment of being the first to do what has now become a commonplace thrill. But as I lean over Lauren and brush back the lock of hair which always falls into her eyes, I don't tell her the good things I've done. Instead, I download a confession to horrible crimes. I beg her to believe that the man she fell in love with isn't the free langa the history's curse. I also tell her not to waste time searching for me. My body morphs its very DNA and memories into a new life every time I run. If I can't remember who I am, if the Mavich itself can barely find me, she'll have no chance. I almost tell her I'll never forget her, but I don't want to lie, so I simply say she doesn't deserve this, that our 14 years together were the best of my life, of any of my lives. Then I run. As I leave our apartment for the pressure dome's artificial breezes, I expect the Mavich to be waiting for me, its claws and teeth stretching space-time, its body wrapping me into the perfect vengeance of its being. I remember what my brother Jared once said, how nothing escapes the Mavich, how once it scents your body and mind and soul, no amount of change will keep it from you. I briefly wonder who among my millions of victims created this beast for me. But that doesn't matter. As I run for the dome's emergency escape pods, my last thought is of Jared, wondering how far my brother got before his Mavich merged their souls into its own special hell. Antarctica's freeze-dried desert burns my nostrils as I stand guard over my buddies, who sleep double-stacked in our platoon's pressure tent. I remember an old nature sim Lauren and I downloaded about these Antarctic rock valleys, where only a centimeter of snow falls each century. 
Now, as I actually breathe deep of the place, I realize the sim never captured the continent's true reality. I wish I could share this with Lauren. Then I remember that I'm now female. I wonder if that would bother Lauren and realize with sadness that it would. I sight my weapon along the horizon, looking for the Mavich. My platoon and I are in a giant bowl of a valley, rimmed by massive ancient mountains. In the distance, I see several human bodies, Freelanga, created by me. I even recognize one of them and wonder how that particular SOB survived so long before being killed. Of course, in this freeze-dried desert, the SOB could have died decades ago and still look fresh killed. Even though my modified body wouldn't freeze unless colder than liquid nitrogen, I instinctively shiver for a moment. Through my link with my platoon, I feel their absolute trust in me. They'd never believe that I created the Freelanga we'd fought for the last decade. As my body shivers yet again, this time because it knows the Mavich is closing in, I remember Gunny Sam, shot three times while pulling me to safety after I was wounded, or Corporal Tassany, who ran all night across the moon's surface to tell headquarters that our platoon was surrounded and our communications grid dead. She saved us and didn't double think it, merely gave me a hug and whispered that us gals gotta look out for the big dumb jocks. All the big dumb jocks laughed at that. After all, the only rule of combat is never let down the person beside you. Dear God, please don't make me let them down. I leave the perimeter for a moment and look in the tent. Gunny Sam, Corporal Tassany, all of them sleep soundly because of their trust of me. We fought on a dozen worlds. We're closer than any family. I'm not going to do it, I tell my body. I'm not going to leave them to die. At least let me wake them. But as I scan the horizon again, I see the Mavich climbing down an icy mountain. Light bends around its teeth and claws. Inside its mouth, I see the galaxy of stars, the last sight it gives before vengeance is created. I fight my body's leaving, fight the urge to run and remake myself and forget yet again who I am. But then, like before, I'm running. I jump into the platoon's shuttle and fly into the sky. I pray I haven't betrayed my platoon mates to their death. Pray the Freelanga don't notice that no one's guarding the platoon until my buddies wake. But the Freelanga always look for the briefest sign of weakness. I should know. I'm the SOB who created them. I'm the selfish SOB who programmed this damn Freelanga body to keep running and changing and running. I lean back in my chair as Dr. Daniels drones on about the difficulties she's had in replicating the genomic vaccine. I nod, even though I'm no longer listening to her words. Instead, I look out the window at the hospital's Martian gardens. I planted half the bioengineered pines out there. Many are now so big I can't reach around them. My little contribution to the planet's terraforming efforts. I stand and walk to the window, looking for the Mavich. Dr. Daniels thinks nothing of this. Assuming I'm deep in thought about the plague that's ripping through the Mars colony. What I'm really wondering, though, is why the Mavich took almost 50 years to find me, and why it couldn't have waited just one more week. As Dr. Daniels talks, I want to interrupt her, to ask if she ever studied the histories on the Freelanga. Dr. Daniels is young, just out of medical school, so I doubt she's bothered to download the detailed story of my former people how I created the modification which swept through the bodies of my true believers and turned brother against brother and brother into brother, how my Freelanga murdered millions before people decided my teachings about the eternal mutability of self weren't worth killing for. I turn and look at the sims which hover over the conference table, images of disfigured women and men, kids with skin half burned away, The entire hospital has been focused on finding a cure to the out-of-control disease, lashing its way through our population. In the last month, we released two potential cures, only to see both fail. That's when I see the Mavich, walking slowly across the red-tinged desert, its light distorting spider legs shooting out to rocks and boulders, as it tracks me down for vengeance. I plead with it, beg for more time. I've done good, you see. 
helps people. Not enough to wipe out my debt, but I have the cure to this plague. It's in my head right now. As I watch the Mavich approach, I curse myself for not telling Dr. Daniels about the cure I'd worked out. After the hospital's last two disappointments, I hadn't wanted to raise anyone's hopes. But as I walk out of the conference room and my body tenses to run, I glance a final time at the pictures of the dying colonists. This is yet another sin I'll have to account for one day. For the briefest of moments, I wonder if that's how the Mavich wants it. And then I run. I'm breastfeeding my baby in the nursery when my body realizes that the Mavich is right outside the house. I protectively cradle Alice's body before logic says she'll be safer in her crib. As I lay her down, she sighs, content in being fed and being loved. I run my fingers through her curly black hair for a moment, then walk quickly to my bedroom. Paul's stinger is in the drawer where he always keeps it. I remember how often I've asked him to get rid of the gun, How many times he repeated irritating clichés about the jungles of the old Russian tundra being a dangerous place. As I pull the stinger out, I bless Paul for his foresight. I glance at him, sleeping in the bed, and blow a kiss as I walk outside to confront the Mavich, cursing with all my might the SOB I once was. At first I don't see the beast, but then the trees shimmer, and I realize it's standing right before me. I'm glad my body didn't detect the Mavich until it was too late to run. While my body still aims to defend itself, I touch my love for Alice and Paul and realize that I prefer death to running away again. The Mavich pads around me, its gaping mouth of space and time wrinkling to a billion newly created stars. My body raises the stinger and fires, but the gun can't harm something that barely exists. I smile at my coming death. I remember my love for Lauren, my betrayal of my platoon, the thousands I could have saved on Mars, the millions more my original self killed because I was so in love with my own perverted ideals. Most of all, I feel my love for Alice and Paul. I don't care how hard my original self worked to save his life. It's not worth the pain I feel for those I continually leave behind. The Mavich steps towards me, and from its gaping mouth, I hear the cries of those I murdered so many years ago. I brace myself, beg Alice to forgive me, take comfort in knowing that Paul will love and raise our child. But then the Mavich pauses, flickers, the distortions which form its body fading. In that instant, I realize my body is going to run again, that it's going to reach Paul's jump bike behind the house that my body will once again escape and change and create a new life, a life that I'll only understand when I'm once again forced to abandon everyone and everything I've come to love. However, even as I realize this, my body's instinct to run misses a beat. I flick the stinger at my legs and fire, shattering bones and muscles. I fall, screaming to the ground. The pain is almost too much to bear, but I take pride in having stopped my body. I brace myself and stare up at the Mavich as it reforms even stronger than before. The beast opens its mouth impossibly wide, appears ready to envelop the entire world with its vengeance. I pray that Alice forgives me and close my eyes and open them again to find the Mavich squatting before me, grinning. Kill me, I think. Give your creators the vengeance they told you to deliver. But the Mavich merely sits there, grinning. It then steps back and disappears into the forest. That's when I understand the Mavich's true vengeance. Paul runs outside and holds me, presses his hands onto my destroyed legs to slow the bleeding. He tells me a medical shuttle is on its way. They'll repair you in no time, he says. I think of Alice, sleeping soundly in her bedroom, and realize that Paul is right. I'll be repaired in no time, and then my body will be running, 
and changing and running again. Thankfully, Paul believes it's merely the pain from my legs that makes me cry and cry and cry. Author's note. Jason Sanford here. I wrote Free Longa to explore what happens when people change their lives so completely they don't even know who they once were. I was also curious about this specific question. What happens when a person commits horrible sins, then becomes a new person with no knowledge of those sinful acts? Do the sins still follow them? In this case, the sins most definitely follow the narrator as the Mavich, a creature designed to seek perfect vengeance pursues the narrator across time and space. But what the narrator thought this vengeance would be, simply being caught and killed, turns out to be totally different from the vengeance the Mavich had in mind. In fact, I think this mirrors how vengeance works in real life. After all, payback's a cruel, nasty bastard, and sometimes the bastard has his own ideas on the specific payback we all deserve. All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that story. I did myself. Uh, You're not going to ask the robot what he thought of the story? Oh, wait, OT. What did you think of that story? All right, I'll, I'll buy it. What did he say? He liked it. Oh, all right. <laughs> no insults for me at all in that one. Well, he did say he liked it a lot more than your stories. You know, in this case, I can't. I was saying, in this case, I can't really blame him. But I can always blame him. That robot sucks. Who programmed <laughs> the personality in that thing? That's that's factory presets. I didn't change anything yet. What? <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, I'm a little bit out of it tonight because Big has a cat. Hat, 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 <laughs> hey, it's hat, your fault. Hat. You played with the cat. I was trying to kill the cat. It just thought it was a game. It bested you again. Oh, right, O.T., can you cut out all this stuff? <clears throat> In fact, let's just start over. Welcome to the Dude Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I liked this story very much. Me too. Do, do we want to tell the viewer? There's no viewers. There's, <laughs> there's even less viewers than there are yeah, listeners. That's right. We've got one listener, no viewers. I'm wondering uh, if the listener is at all interested in how we got this story. Well, why don't you tell the story and we'll see. All right. Well, once there was a, a little boy and he was... There were, well, let's start earlier. There was an old man and an old woman and they had not been graced with children. They figured that the time had passed. Okay. Uh, let me help you out with a story. Oh. A few months ago, uh, I talked with Tony C. Smith of the Starship Sofa podcast. And I volunteered us to do a few readings for his podcast because they do stories over there as well. And he said, all right. And we did a reading for him. Oh, we it was a good story. sent it out to him. And uh, he said, wow, that was, that, you guys did a really good job. You want to read some more stories? And so he sent us a few more. And so the second story that we read was by an author named Jason Sanford. We read this story and we're like, wow, this story is really good. Jason mentioned that he has a story that was uh, going to be appearing. In I am this meat. <laughs> In his intro, he said he had a a story forthcoming in the year's best SF-14. And I'm willing to bet that it's that story that Rish and I read because it was fantastic. Yeah, it's weird. We uh, try and read the stories that people submit to us before we record them so that we don't. uh, Like one time I did an audio story and I got to the very, very end and I realized that the the guy with the British accent (laughs) was the grandson of the main American character that I was also doing the voice of. I was like, oh, no, because, you know, (laughs) they didn't have the same accent. So we always try and get that stuff out of the way by reading through it. And I remember, like, looking up and saying, dude, this story is rad, man. And, you know, I'm about 20-something years too late for having said rad, but... Yeah, well, actually, no, it was okay, because I think we we did that in 1987, wasn't it? But, (laughs) yeah, this is no uh, exaggeration. That was one of the best stories I'd ever read, was, was Sanford's first story. It was really good. So, yeah, I I sought him out and I said, we have a podcast. And last night or two nights ago, we read your story and it was just rad. 
And, and he laughed. <laughs> I think that's what won him over, your use of the word rad. <laughs> and I said, hey, do you do have any stories by any chance that we could do on our podcast? And uh, he not only said, yeah, he, he, he gave us three to choose from. And I, I thought that was really cool. He got right back to us. He seemed very friendly. But he this, has... guy, this guy has been published in Go Anal, which is like the first or second biggest sci-fi publication. Is that the pig Latin version of analog? Oh, I, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> Freudian slip, folks. Uh-huh. But yeah, like unlike that story that uh, Norm Sherman read on our podcast, this guy is a real writer. <laughs> and uh, he's got to be one of, if not the highest profile writers we've had on the show. Uh-huh. And for him to be just so friendly and say, here, here's a story. If, you know, if you want another one, dance monkey. I thought that that was really nice. <laughs> yeah, and you did. A- I hope that uh, he likes the way we did this story and that he lets us do another. And, and you know what? If you are a writer, a real writer or an imaginary writer or an aspiring writer or the ghost of a famous writer, <laughs> and you've got a story that you'd like to submit to the podcast, send it on over to submissions at dunesteef.com. We will look it over. I would hope that you would look over the submission guidelines before you did so, but we would be very happy, especially if it was as good as this one, to do it on our podcast. That's right. Am I promising too much? I don't think so. We'll read it. We'll read it. We won't necessarily accept it, but you'll get a fair shake. That's right, especially if you're the ghost of a famous writer. Raymond Chandler's ghost, if you're out there. And yes, feel free to submit a story to us. We'd really like to see what Ernest Hemingway's ghost is up to these days. You might even make a couple bucks off of it because we try to pay our authors. Yeah. I've been talking and talking, and we've got two listeners left that haven't turned it off. Before they go, why don't you take over? You may make a couple bucks. We do pay our authors. We'd like to pay them more, for that matter. I promise you'll make more than Jason Sanford. So maybe that would make more authors want to submit. I don't know. But the way we would do that is through listener donations. We have a little button on our website, a PayPal donation button. And what should you do? I press the button. You should do what she did. That's right. Please donate to the show. So, yes, if you press the button, there's several different options you can choose. There's a one-time donation button, though you can just choose your amount and just give that one time. Or you can subscribe to the magazine, as it were, and pay $5 a month or $5 a quarter. It's all up to you. And I tell you this, if you press that button, I will make Rish tell the story of how he once hugged Richard Simmons. <laughs> I, I'm not going to tell that story. Yes, you will. No, it, listen. Hey, R O H T, please cut out that part about the Richardsons. O eight O T, you know who to listen to. Do not cut that out. No, no, R O eight O T. I'm sort of your master. You will cut it out, dude. You're nobody's master. Don't cut it out. You're fine. No, R O eight O T. I hate to do this, but I order you to cut that oh, out. Oh, order! Who does he think he is? I, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the robot. Cut it out. Yeah, he's not gonna. We'll hear that story. Coming up. Well, see, now I'm torn because I'm not going to tell the story about how I hu- – I, I, I don't even know what you're talking about because I never would have <laughs> hugged that man. But yet also I want them to donate. So. Yes. So they'll donate and you'll tell the story. No. You've promised already. It's too late. I promise nothing. I promise to cut it out later. And as much as I'd like people to donate, I know that we're having hard times right now. Not everybody is able to. But you can help us. By telling a friend about our podcast That's or right. linking to our podcast if you have a website or a blog. Blo- uh, yeah, blogging about the podcast and telling people who read your blog why you enjoy the podcast and why they must come and listen. They must. They must or something terrible, truly terrible will happen That's right. to the person they love most. <laughs> who is the person you love most, babe? Do you love your wife or your children more? I don't ask because something terrible is going to happen to one of them. Unless... You ask because you want to do that two-face experiment on them, don't you? You're going to point a gun at each one and ah, see which one makes me more upset when you point right. the gun at them. I think we have a winner. <laughs> do you want to answer that question or should we move on? We can move on. Folks, if you donate this week, in addition to the Richard Simmons story, Big will tell you who he loves most on the earth. <laughs> but another Turns thing that you can it's do. my cat. Enough about the cat thing. I mean, wow. We've already got 14 hate letters. Another thing that people can do is they can go onto iTunes. You can subscribe to us on iTunes. That's right. You can give us a review on iTunes. Yeah. I think you can recommend us to other people on iTunes or or recommend that people stay the hell away. 
Another thing they can do is they can go on Facebook or they can go to MySpace. We have a page on both. That's right. Uh, you can add us as a friend. That's right. Or you can add us as a fan. I think that people have actually said that they're a fan. And dude, that makes me feel good. Yeah, I think you become a fan of the Dune Steve magazine or you can add Rish or Big as your friend. I think that how, how that works. That would be cool. That's right. I hope to be able to continue to do this week after week. Times are tough, as we've said. And Big is considering getting another job. And so if that happens, then I'm sure we won't be weekly anymore. Yeah, Not that we ever were, but we tried no for a little while there. And just the, the more word of mouth, the more people that know about us, the better it is. I'm sure there are a lot of Jason Sanford fans. And if this is the first episode that you have heard from us, I'm sorry that we are not more talented. And, and handsome. I mean, one of us is handsome, but I'm sorry that we're not both well, handsome. Luckily, this is an audio fiction magazine, so they don't really have to deal with how handsome or not handsome we are. I am not an animal. Again, I think like we said in our Oscar episode, uh, I wanted to thank people f- who have donated, thank people who have helped us with voices, with editing, with, with art, with submitting. Yeah, the, the, the girl that read the Megan's Bridge and the girl that <laughs> did the drawing, I want to thank both of them. The, Reading the submissions, those that have done that, it's making things possible to really work out. So again, thank you. Thank you also for not making me do the Richard Simmons story. I never met the man. You know, I just realized this is the last episode of the winter issue. Yes, that's true. So next will be the fall. Yes, this is the eve of the... uh, Wait, fall? Kind of a doofus are you? Next is spring. You do know that. Anyway, sorry. Yes, this is the eve. All goes well. This is March 31st when people are hearing this. Well, you you plan on the exact date that this is... The exact date. That's right. Wow, that's cool. You know, usually at the end of each issue, we try and talk about the three months that have passed and then what people can look forward to in the next. Do you think we should do that this week? Sure. I'm down with that. We usually talk about the state of the podcast. It's a wretched state of filth and degradation. Much like Texas. But uh, one thing that we did promise is that we were going to have an event. Oh, that's right. Holy cow. Uh, If this is March 31st, then that event starts tomorrow. That's right. Starting tomorrow, April 1st, begins the, the all topless Dune Steve audio fiction. <laughs> when me and Rish are sitting here topless and doing this show. Yeah. Pasty white and large gut. Have you gotten that back hair problem taken care of? Mostly. It's interesting what you can do with a large roll of masking tape and a lot of yanking. Well, I gotta tell you, I know a thing or two about yanking, so... uh... Anyways, back to the event. It's the Broken Broken Mirror Mirror Story Story Event. event. That's catchy, right? Oh, well. Well, that's what it is. Why don't you explain to the good folks at home real quickly, what is a Broken Mirror Story? We did mention it last week, but just to catch them up. Big and I like to write stories. Or, I'm sorry, I like to write stories. Big likes to talk about someday writing a story, and then he doesn't do it. (laughs) But we came up with this fun idea one time of saying, hey, let's both write a story with the same premise. And then we'll compare them, we'll swap them, we'll read each other's stories and see how different or similar the stories came out. And for some reason, I think you started calling them broken mirror stories. Yeah, I was just trying to come up with a catchy name and that didn't work out. And so, yeah, it's just like, okay, Mickey Mouse, the cartoon character, comes violently, hideously to life. And then we both have to write a story about Mickey Mouse coming violently, hideously to to life. And yeah, for some reason, it's really, really fun. Yeah, it was uh, was enjoyable. I really like doing it. It's fun to see what happens when two different people take a very basic premise and go with it. And they always go in different directions. But there's always some things that are similar as well. It's really fun to see. See, And I I hope if you were a writer or an aspiring writer of The Ghost of a Writer... That this sounds fun to you, too. That this sounds like something you'd like to participate in. And we're opening up the gates tomorrow, April 1st. Although April 1st is kind of synonymous with George W. Bush. So I don't want people to think it's a joke. It's not a joke. Help me out here. That's right. This is real here, folks. April 1st through April 30th, we challenge you to write a story based on the premise, which we will provide to you during this very show. 
anyone who who likes to write stories, we open it up, send it in to us, and uh, we'll we'll read through all of them, and we'll uh, decide a few finalists, like we did with the October Scary Story event. We ended up with four very solid, very good stories. We then made episodes of, and we'll do the same thing with our Broken Mirror stories, and everyone will get the chance. A- and we will pay you. It's not just the honor of being podcast. That's right. You'll still get a check. You will get a couple of bucks. Or yes, that's right. You'll get a handful of sweaty, dirty change. But yes, we will make episodes. We will take your story and we will turn it into an audio fiction magazine extravaganza. That's like making it better. Do. Of course. Uh, it you will... know, it's funny. This is like our 27th episode and I've never had somebody email us and say, hey, you made my story better. Well, there's a reason for that. Uh, R.O.T., please cut out my tears. You had a good cry, though, about it, and that's all that matters. Okay, we're back. Hey, we're back! Big and I have been arguing for an hour about what the idea should be, what the premise should be, what the concept should be. Oh, yes, it was an hour. (laughs) Yeah, we've been going for an hour, and we've narrowed it down to this. All right. Okay, so again, this is your assignment, should you choose to accept it. Ba-ba-da-da! For the month of April, write a story based on the following premise. Since it was Big's suggestion, I'm going to have him read it. Someone arrives in town and discovers that everyone there is exactly the same. You can interpret that however you'd like to. You can choose what the genre is. You can choose the length. It doesn't. I'm not going to say it has to be between 300 and 3,000 words or anything like that. If you feel inspired and you want to write a long story about this, that's cool. If you want to write something very, very short, we've been talking back and forth about maybe combining short stories, doing more than one story in an, in an episode if, if somebody sends something like like Spiritual Tripping way back uh, was. Or I, I don't know. Also, uh, if you have any questions, just send us the questions and we'll try, and to, try to address them. You've got a month to do this. If, if you're listening to this when we first publish, you've got a month. But each week we'll remind people, we'll repeat this premise. That's right. We'll put a post on the blog about it so that uh, in case you haven't listened to the show yet, but you check every now and then. I don't know who would do that. But anyways, (laughs) there will be a post on the blog about this and I'll probably throw it into the submission guidelines as well like I did with the October Story event. Yeah, I hope that that catches somebody's fancy. I got to say, the wheels in my mind have started turning. Since you looked at that loony old man? Yeah. And, you know, I promised myself that I would marry a cartoon character someday. (laughs) I think it's a pretty nonspecific premise that you could go a number of ways. But please, just just do one submission. If you're super inspired and you want to do more than one, just send us... What, what you think is the best one. You can set it whatever genre you want. You can set it in whatever continent you want. You can do whatever, uh, I mean... You only have the very beginning. Not India, please. I, I kind of have a problem with India. Really? India is not a continent, is it? it is it's, a su- it's a subcontinent. Oh, is it? Yes. Subcutaneous. No. <laughs> Lord. Uh, you know, we've been talking for a long time, but my guess is that not a lot of this is going to be in the podcast. That's right. So I just wanted to mention briefly, we were talking last week about when... We've got an idea and then it turns up somewhere else and it just breaks my heart or it infuriates me or the wheels in my head start turning. And uh, I saw this trailer for a Seth Rogen movie the other day where he plays a mall cop who's kind of a loser and then he gets a chance to to make a name for himself as the mall cop and impress this girl and that. And I just thought, wow, of, of all bad times for this to come out, we just had that Paul Blart movie with Kevin James, which was a huge hit. It did, it did just tremendous business, and I just thought, if I were the distributor of this of this Seth Rogen mall movie, I would just put it on the shelf or something. No way you want to release another mall cop movie that soon after a movie called Mall Cop. <laughs> Wasn't it mall, called Mall Cop? I think it was called Paul Blart Mall Cop. Okay. I don't know. Again, it's just how did these things happen? I'm, I'm absolutely sure, even without ever talking to the people involved – that the Seth Rogen people didn't rip off the Paul Blart people. It's just these things happen. It's funny, but I think it's kind of like the zeitgeist that's just out there. The thing that's going on, the style or whatever. It's like it's it's just out there and 
some people get zapped by the lightning from it or something. And apparently there's always the, the two bolts at least going out. And, you know, we, we talked the, about... They're making a sequel to Bolt? You know, we, we mentioned, for example, Armageddon and Deep Impact. Same summer those two came out. And I don't think they tried to rip each other off either. I think it was that whole zeitgeist thing. Asteroids hitting the Earth was the cool thing for that summer. And two different studios started working on films that happened to do with that. And they must have just gotten too far along to say, oh, crap. Fox is doing one on an asteroid, too. Well, we're going to save ours. And I think maybe that probably happens a lot, too, where there are some studios that are heading forward. They've greenlit. They're on their way to make a movie. And then they hear about this other one that's coming out. And they're like, oh, crap. Put on the red light again. That one's not coming out. We're not going to spend money on that one. They already beat us to it. That, that's a good point. I think probably... Mm-hmm. We would see a lot more of these double headers. We would we'd see a lot more of these broken mirror movies. <laughs> That's right. If some studios didn't just say, "Hey, we might not make money. We, we might be like that Seth Rogen mall cop movie. Let's let's just push on the brakes, and maybe in 2013 we'll go ahead again." Yeah. Sometimes it also seems like there's the studio that perhaps knows their product is not going to be as good as the other product, and so they rush theirs out. Or, or they go direct to video with it, or or, or direct have it, to video. Have it come out the same week, right. or a, a you know a couple weeks around yeah. the same time. They try and get it out first so that they can make some free money off the publicity that's going to this worthwhile film. But it's funny. Do you remember the other Titanic in '97? Are you serious? I am serious. And it's just like, oh, what James Cameron is doing a Titanic. It's like, what will we do? So they went to directly to television. Catherine Zeta Jones was the star of the really? the other Titanic. I never no, it's that. not something you'll ever think about because Titanic was this giant thing, right? And the other Titanic, it's called Titanic for God's sake. Really? Um, yeah, it's just like nobody even remembers. I, I ninety one. Uh, there were two Robin Hood movies that were supposed to come out that exact same summer, and <laughs> Warner Brothers had their Kevin Costner one, and uh, whoever the other studio was had a Patrick Bergen one, and they're like, oh gosh, what are we gonna do? So they just put the Patrick Bergen one on television. But yeah, you know, the ones that I was actually thinking of when I when I mentioned that was, you know, there's Pixar's movie Bugs Life, which was coming out. And then there was that, was it DreamWorks that did uh, Ants? I think it was the first DreamWorks film. Yeah, the first DreamWorks so CG that film. One, it might have been the second CG film ever. Yeah, it probably was because Bugs Life didn't come out until after it. Although Bugs I think Life they may have tried to Ants. hurry it. Was, was also 98. Was it 98? It was the summer. We talked about Volcano and Dante's, Dante's Peak. Peak, which uh, those were actually both forgettable when it comes down to it. But <laughs> I, uh, I once told Gail Ann Hurd that, hey, you made the good Volcano movie. Yeah, there, there wasn't uh, one of those, actually. But yeah, yeah, like uh, summer of, was it 87 or 88 when we had the body switching movies and they actually had three of them come out uh, and vice versa and 18 again. What was the one with Kurt Cameron? Yeah, Kurt Cameron and Dudley Moore, like father, like son, like father, like son. That's right. And then Big came out, and everybody kind of lumped it in with the bodies because it's technic. I mean, it's similar. You know, Did you ever see Prelude to a Kiss? Yeah, it was actually a good film. That one was actually like three years later. Oh, that was a body. Switching it was movie. another body switching movie. But that was an old. Well, so was Eighteen Again, wasn't it? Eighteen Again was the, and, the George Burns one. Uh, <laughs> Char- Charlie Schlatter was that his name? And then another one of those things that just kept coming up was. Uh, the girl who pretends to be a boy so that she can fill in the blank. Yeah, whatever. So she can get her story published because publishers will only publish stories by men. I think that was what uh, just one of the guys was basically about. Okay, you know what I watched today? What? I watched Shakespeare in Love. So we got a, a woman pretending to be a man, pretending to later pretending to be a woman. But uh, when you said that, that, that reminded me. And last week we were talking about sort of this topic. When we were in college and Shakespeare in Love came out, uh-huh. there was a professor at school who said, "I that was my idea. And he had written a play about William Shakespeare as a young man writing his plays or whatever kind of thing. I was young enough to think, well, is that possible? What kind of thing? But now that I'm older and it's happened to me so many times, <laughs> it's just, yeah, there are these ideas and they just float around and they land on you and they land on me. If you're lucky, you get yours published first or you get yours noticed and that. And If you're lucky, it lands on you instead of just crapping on you and then flying on to land on someone else. And that does happen. (laughs) 
Do you remember that at all? The professor that said, hey, that was my idea. I didn't know that professor, I suppose, because that doesn't sound familiar. But yeah, I mean, it does happen. Uh, you reminded me of the, I mean, I have an idea. It's a very fleshed out idea. And then... Stephanie Meyer came out with a recent novel. And no, it's not the uh, vampire one. It does My idea doesn't involve vampires, but it does involve aliens. And I read that and I thought, crap, this is really kind of similar to that idea. And people will look at that and say, wow, that's really like that Stephanie Meyer book. It's my fault. I should have gone with it and done something with it long ago. Just like I didn't do with clock stoppers. No, no. I think when you first sent me that idea years ago. Uh, Stephanie Meyer was just a, an unknown hack instead of a, a, a world-famous hack. Too. Right. Yeah, I think I had that idea first, and I stand by my story. Okay, you're reading her book, and, and suddenly you get to this part where you're like, oh, no, I see where this is going, and it's my story. Do you stop reading and say, bull crap, mm-hmm. I'm not going to finish reading? Or do you pour through the rest of the book, going over every single page, looking for things? I just, I did continue. I finished reading it, and... It, it wasn't that similar so to where I couldn't write my story. You're still going to write that someday, right? I am. Hopefully before I'm dead, I'll write those. I, maybe I'll be one of those ghost writers, except for I'll be the ghost of a non-famous writer submitting stories still. You are able to keep an idea in your mind indefinitely, and it's like a big piece of, 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 of clay, and every once in a while, you get it out of some some place, and you add to it, and you start to sculpt a little bit, and then you're able to put that piece of clay back in your mind. And six months later, you take it out, and it's all exactly where it was before, and you're still <laughs> able to remember. And you told me from like beginning to end in your mind, you know how the story is supposed to go, and, and how you know here's the twist, and and I just I can't do that. That's really cool. <laughs> To tell you how to develop that idea is I've, I've, I've actually written something down about this idea. No, no, you haven't. I did, I did. No, no, no. Well, I typed it. You've never written anything. <laughs> I know you. And I was complimenting you with this whole clay analogy. Obviously, you felt like it was some kind of insult, and so you were forced to lie to our good <laughs> listeners. But no, no, I was complimenting you because I can't do that. With me, it's like an ice sculpture. And I work on the ice sculpture, and then I set it on the shelf. And when I go back to the shelf, there's just like a wet shelf. Yeah, it's, it's even ruined your shelf, unfortunately. It's it's destroyed the wood a little bit. You know me too well. Writing it down is like taking a picture of your ice sculpture, isn't it? Oh, listen to that. Another one of those things that you mentioned was uh, one time, I've, I've written a couple of little stories for my kids. One, no, time, <laughs> one time I was writing one uh, for my son that was about his first day at preschool. I, I believe uh, that was published in Necrotic Tissue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I get to the end of it, and I was thinking of a toy that they could have in the preschool, and thinking robots and alphabet, and out of the blue I came up with this, the Alphabots. The alphabots. alphabots. And I wrote them in there, and they're these robots that have to do with letters of the alphabet, obviously. I just thought, holy cow, what a cool idea. That that name itself, I think you mentioned this when I told you about it. You're like, that's how you sell, you sell it with the one sheet or something like that. I don't remember what the expression was. But basically just saying the alphabets and putting a picture up there. And you could show somebody this and be like, sold. I want that cartoon. And I just thought, gosh, it'd be perfect for a Dora the Explorer type cartoon on like PBS Kids or something that teaches them uh, how to read or or whatever. And, you know, Dora goes out with the alphabets and... Dora versus the alphabets. (laughs) One shall stand, Dora. Wait, what is the Dora little thing? Swiper, no swiping, you (laughs) bastard. But yeah, along the way they see signs or something and the robot helps her to read them and... All this stuff. And I was even coming up like, I was like, oh, yeah. And we could have like the kid in the show could be TJ or JT or whatever. You know, it's a kid that's referred to by initials. What a cool thing that would be. And and then I thought one day, oh, you know, maybe I should Google the Alphabots. Just Why? In case. I Google the Alphabots. It'll be like that Dean Kuntz story where you discover a book that you haven't written yet. And you look at like the publishing date and it's like six years in the future and you're like, oh my gosh. And you read the author's note and it mentions things that haven't happened to you yet. It turned out it wasn't like that at all. But what it was like is I found that somebody had written a children's book called The Alphabots back in the 80s. Therefore, the 
name Alphabots had been taken. I heard Satan laughing with delight. And I was, day, I was so day. sad because, gosh, I even have a friend who works in cartoons. And I thought, holy cow, we could sell this cartoon to somebody and I'd roll in the money. Oh, it would be so perfect. And bam, like a fly swatter splatting me to the wall. I, I, I know exactly where you're coming from. I am so easily discouraged with that stuff. And the second script I ever wrote, my senior year of college... So we, I was pitching it in our class, and some student said, oh, it's like Time Cop. And yeah, after that, it's just like, I didn't even want to write another word on that thing. <laughs> it was such a great yeah. idea. I'm always living in fear that somebody is going to say, hey, you obviously ripped off something else. And I, I don't know what it is. That's, that's one of my fears alongside of old people and children. <laughs> I, well, I, you know, I'll bet if, if Jason Sanford is listening to this, I'll bet he, as a real writer, would say, if you have an idea and you haven't written it down, you're effed. Yeah. It's like whoever puts in the work and writes it down and gets it out there first owns that idea. Yeah, it's probably you, how they say it, but I, I don't beyond know. Beyond that, you probably have to actually copyright it too. Oh, but okay, going back to what we said last week and what we're saying here about this broken mirror event is that two people can have the exact same idea. But they bring different life experiences, they bring different styles, they bring different intentions to the story, and those stories can go completely in different directions and be perfectly perfectly rad stories <laughs> in and of themselves. And I, I hope that there are people out there who got this idea of yours and said, I'm going to write the alphabets. No, no, no. They got this idea of yours <laughs> and said, I'm going to write this. And uh, it'll be interesting if people start submitting what stories are similar and how they're different and how people interpret the words differently. Right? I think it is. I, I don't know. Hopefully other people do as well. We'll Whoops. have to see. So get to work. Jeez. What are you still sitting there? Get writing. The podcast isn't over. Oh, yeah. That's probably. Wait until it's over. Then get to work. Okay. So that's everything, right? Yes. It's time for the hate letter of the week. What? I, I thought we had gotten away from that. How many weeks have we had without a hate letter? A couple. A couple. <laughs> well, all right. If you don't want to read it, then we don't have to. I have no, generally, uh, we read these. Uh, I, I, I'll take it. I'll take one for the team, all right? Uh, okay. Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. I have listened to a few of your podcasts, mostly because one of my friends had a story of theirs read... And I wanted to support him. And I have to admit, you made his story sound good. Nice. For some reason, I listened to the banter afterward. And then the next episode, and then the next. I'm a very tolerant woman. I could stand your silly accents and extremely fake arguments. We, you know, we never talked about this before, but when we did feedback, for example, we were yelling at each other, and my wife actually woke up from her bed, came and said, hey, is there something wrong? Are you guys fighting? Yeah. She, she came, she asked, do I need to go get the shovel again? And these are, these are, this is really. All right. Just, just All right, continue. Sorry. Ignore what she has. Uh, I was able to abide your ignoramus attitudes about movies and television. Ignore your terrible acting and Rish's unsuccessful impressions. Tolerate your homophobia. Overlook your hatred of Canada, women, and fat people. I don't hate can my wife. She's a woman. She's from Canada, and I'm fat. People and and Rish is gay. What? Well, hey, 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 dude. She's not from Canada anymore. She's married to an American. I guess that's she is, true. She's a citizen of the United States. Okay. And even appreciate your overdone gag about the silly robot. Yeah. Uh, hey, hey, calm down. It's it's all right. She's an equal opportunity offender. It sounds. Like. Yeah. But then I heard you two singing. That was the last straw. You two should not only be ashamed of yourselves, you should be in prison for a long, long time. If there's any justice, the next podcast I hear from you will be from your communal shower room coming back from your one-hour visit to the exercise yard. How do I press that button? Sincerely, Melissa Bice Chittister. I don't really know what to say about this one. Dude, she knows. Somehow somebody saw us. Nobody saw us, Rish. N nobody who's still around, I mean. How can you be sure? All right. I'll check the return address in the envelope. It'll be fine. Don't worry. Uh, uh, keep those cards and letters coming, folks. So that's our show for today. Thanks for listening. 
And just to finish it off, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Each one of us is a brain. And an athlete. And a basket case. A princess. And a criminal. Does that answer your question? Good night. Terrible. Each episode gets worse. <laughs>